I am ready. Okay. I will hit the button now. Okay, we're live. Um, welcome everybody to this month's Institute for Quantum Studies discussion. I am Matt Liefer, co-director of the Institute for Quantum Studies. Um, I also have my helper Kai Wagel here, who is going to be moderating the discussion for you. Um, our guest today is Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who is a professor of physics and physics and astronomy and a core faculty member in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. She's also the author of a, a book that's recently come out this month. Uh, I'm going to show you that I, I'm going to try and show you that I've read it, at least on the Kindle. Uh, there we go. It's called uh, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time and Dreams Deferred. And I, I really think this is almost definitely the most important book about uh, physics that, well, that you should read right now, basically. So I'm giving it high recommendation. So um, welcome, welcome Chanda. Thank you. Thank you for the kind word about the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it is an important book. It's, it's, um, it's not necessarily, I'm not saying, it's, it's a heavy book to read. You kept me up uh, several nights because the only time I have to read is, uh, late at night and and I have to say that I've had a few sleepless nights reading this book um because it but it does cover um very important topics um but I, I just wanted to start by uh just asking you um why why did you decide to write this book what was your motivation and uh, what's the main message that you're trying to get across to people yeah I would say the the book has its own kind of dynamical evolution through time which is the the book that is now out there is not actually the one that I thought I was writing when I when I started so the original idea which was one that my my agent Jessica Pappen had um was that I was publishing a lot online I was writing a lot of blogs and I was publishing in different magazines and stuff like that and she said it would be great to actually just put stuff together in one place that would get it to a different audience. And so originally I thought that what I was really doing was taking things that I had already written and cleaning them up a little bit and putting them together. And then when I actually started to do that, and I think I had about like 25% or 30% of a draft of the book based on things I had already written, a through line kind of revealed itself to me. So I should say that like, um, I, I really think like the process of writing is how you figure out like what you think. That was something people used to say. And I was like, okay, like whatever. But I, I, I feel like I definitely had that experience. But at the end of the day, I found what I really wanted to do was write a holistic book about the, about the doing of physics and particularly about the doing of particle physics and cosmology. There are lots of things about other areas of physics that I am not confident to touch on. But I wanted to give people a look at what's exciting about particle physics and cosmology, and also what's challenging about trying to do particle physics and cosmology. So it's really a holistic look at the field. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, now, uh, before, before we started, you told me uh, that uh, when you've been interviewed by uh, some Jewish people, they'd like to focus on the Jewish aspects of the book. I'm not going to do that too much. I'm Jewish as well, but, uh, but I did want to um, raise uh, the question of the blessings that you have at the beginning and, and the end of the book. So the, the book uh, starts and finishes with the blessings in Hebrew. And uh, uneducated person that I am, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to recognize them or, or where they came from. So, so could you tell us the story behind that? Yeah, so I, I think that you know, at some point I realized that the book was very much like, this is very much my personal perspective on, on these topics. And so I wanted to make sure that my Jewish identity played a role in that. And so I was thinking about like, what are Jewish traditions? And I was like, well, we're supposed to pray at the beginning of things and we're supposed to pray at the end of things. Right. And so the prayer that appears at the beginning of the book is actually the Ma'ariv, so the evening prayer. Right, yeah. Originally, I had the Shechechiyanu because we use that a lot for, you know, just like the start of things to, to, to bless things. And what ended up happening is I, I'm a member of a Reconstructionist temple and I called my rabbi and I said, okay, I think I need to have a prayer at the beginning and a prayer at the end, but I'm not sure what to do. And she was the one who said, well, since your book is talking about the night sky so much, 
you should start with the evening prayer where you're welcoming the evening star and you should end with the traveler's prayer because you're sending people off in into into the world and and then of course because we're reconstructionists she was like don't worry about the translation from hebrew into english you can interpret it how you want to and so the english interpretation is not it's my interpretation it's not a, a, a literal and she gave me a couple of suggestions to work with so rabbi toba gets a lot of credit for for helping me with that right yeah i know i i noticed uh, some aspects of the tra translation i mean i noticed that you used uh, universe as the translation for the the, the Hebrew word for the Almighty. Um, so is that is that <laughs> how you think about uh, is that how you think about God? Or yeah, I I am I don't believe in the supernatural, and I, I I should say like I'm I'm agnostic about it, right? Like sure. I'm I haven't seen evidence for it, so I and I don't feel faith about it, and so I didn't want people to walk away from because it appears at the end of the introduction reading the introduction and going, oh, this is a book that's going to be about God because right. yeah. I'm not the person to go to for that. There are other, I'm sure there are other physicists you can find for that conversation. I also think in the reconstructionist tradition that we have a very expansive kind of way of thinking about what God is. And so um, that doesn't necessarily involve the supernatural. And so I was trying to find ways to embed that in, in a way that would make sense to someone who's like not a reconstructionist Jew. Right. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to veer away from uh, the religion towards the science. I, because I, I think you might have talked about that in, enough in other interviews. Um, so, you know, the book contains a lot about, um, you know, your perspective, the perspective that you've had uh, as a minority going through the process of becoming a, a scientist. Um, and, you know, one of the things that does come through in the book is that, you know, it's not like there are chapters on science and there are chapters on racism, for instance. It's it really it is an integrated whole. So I I can't just talk to you about the science without talking to you about the other about those other things. Um, and I have to say, you know, I've had I had some uh, sort of realizations myself while re while reading the book. Things that uh, you know, hearing things from your perspective that I hadn't really thought about before. So um, one of those things was just the question of how one chooses what research to do, right? So in particular, um, coming from a sort of mi a mon minority perspective, um, it occurred to me, and I don't know whether this is true, that you might feel more pressure than uh, other scientists do to sort of stick to the conventional wisdom, to not be, to not sort of go out and, and be very, very bold in your hypotheses. You know, there is this sort of um, egoism in, in physics where, you know, if you, if you propose something very radical and pretend to be the new Einstein, um, certainly if you're a white male, that's, uh, <laughs> that's sometimes often viewed as a positive thing. Um, so, but nonetheless, you have worked on some sort of very bold science. Um, during your PhD, you were looking at um, dark energy from the perspective of loop quantum gravity, a very unusual thing to do. And you started working very early on the uh, axion, uh, axions as a candidate for dark matter before it was a, now it's kind of a popular thing to do, but when you started it, it wasn't. So uh, I was wondering what's the story behind how you ended up uh, working on those things? How did, you know, how did you choose to work on those things? And, you know, did you feel that pressure to, to be doing things that are more mainstream. Yeah, I, I appreciate this question and, and the framing of it. It makes me think of a conversation that I had with my, my father after I had started my PhD program at Perimeter Institute in the University of Waterloo. I can't remember what rant I was on, but I was saying something about like excluding like white women and minorities from physics. And I was saying, you know, what if the next Marie Curie doesn't get through the door. And my dad corrected me. And, and I should say, you know, for, for the record that my, my dad is a white Jewish man, but my dad corrected me and said, we know that Marie Curie gets through the door. That's how we know her name. The question is, what about all of the people who are not like her? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in, in that sense, you know, I want people to pick up my book, please buy my book. Um, 
But I also want to caution people about looking at me as an example or a model for like what uh, I'm like literally a model minority, because I think some of the the path that I took that you that you outlined was because I just felt entitled to to go and make decisions. And so a really good example of this is that I started in a PhD program in astronomy at UC Santa Cruz, and it's one of the best PhD programs in astronomy in the world. And the students who come out of the program are wildly successful at getting like named fellowships and go on to be faculty. Um, so in a lot of ways, just staying there would have written my ticket in a lot of ways, except that I decided that I really wanted to work on quantum gravity. And I didn't think that the string theory community would be welcoming to me. And I liked the ideas behind loop quantum gravity. And so I kind of like engineered this move to Perimeter Institute in the University of Waterloo. And everybody was like, that is a totally unhinged thing. What are you doing? You're throwing away a guaranteed future. And at that point, when I made that decision, I was like 24 years old and I'm I, I think one thing that I brought to the table is I had that kind of hubris of, I'm sure it'll work out for me. <laughs> like, I really, I just believed it would work out for me. I think that was one thing. And the other thing is that even though I had grown up in like a, a poor, like working class, single parent household in East LA, in East Los Angeles, my mom had, um, was taken care of financially once I was in college. And so I didn't feel the pressure of I have to make this work for me financially because there are other people depending on me. And, right. and so I think that gave me some freedom to wander and not worry about sending money home or not worry that I had to be within driving distance of home, which like when I was in Santa Cruz, I could drive down to LA, but I didn't have people I was taking care of that depended on me like that. So I think that that, that, that early in my career, that's what happened. I think later when I came to working on axion Bose Einstein condensates, which like everybody, it's all the rage now to think about wave dark matter and fuzzy dark matter and all of these things. But right, in 2014, when I started working on it, Europeans were thinking about it, a couple of Americans, but axions were not um, everybody's favorite dark matter candidate. At that point, it was, this is, this is a research project that's available to me and I'm a postdoc and I desperately need a research project and I'm a little bit lost where I am. And so the, and that was definitely shaped by experiences that I was having with racism that had meant that I was in not the best situation and kind of had to like grab hold of what, situ what opportunities were in front of me. To, to basically literally like hanging on for dear life, I think is the way to think about it. And so at different points, sometimes I was free to make my own decision. And then sometimes I was just trying to hang on to my career. Okay. So, but I mean, in general, do you feel, I mean, do you feel more of a pressure to, do you feel some kind of a profession, to, a pressure to conform to the views of, uh, of the scientific community? Because I mean, I, I think, you know, my own, my own uh, way of doing things is, you know, have this like very anti-authoritarian streak. I want to say that every, everything that everybody else says is complete rubbish. And I, you know, like, <laughs> only, only I know the right thing. But it is, it is to some degree a very white male way of doing science, right? I, I think to sort of just, I mean, I wouldn't say I have huge amounts of self-confidence, but, you know, that's kind of the way I, I picture uh, what I'm doing in my research, uh, whether or not it's actually true. Um, I didn't notice that in your book, um, you know, there have been controversies about uh, theoretical physics in, in recent years. Um, you know, there have been you know, several books criticizing, for example, string theory or, um, you know, because in theoretical physics now, high energy physics, cosmology, we are in a very speculative period, right? We know that there are problems. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. We don't know if there's any physics beyond the standard model. And so, you know, we are in a very sort of speculative phase. Um, but I noticed that, you know, when, when these things came up in your book, you tended to back off. You tended to say, you know, I, I can't remember if this is actually an example, but, you know, is string theory true? Maybe, you know, it's like, 
Uh, you didn't you didn't really express strong opinions about those things, and I was wondering if there if there was a, a reason behind that. Yeah, so I guess I will say, you know, maybe people will be people who know me or are familiar with with my work might be surprised to hear me use this word to describe myself. But I think as a scientist, I'm relatively conservative. I think that, right. <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's part of it. Um, and 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 maybe anarchist at the same time, like and in the sense that I'm. I really feel like I need to see something compelling before I grab onto something and say, I believe that mm -hmm. I have to be compelled by it. I'm completely comfortable telling people that I work on axions because it is the first dark matter candidate I ran into and found a project on. And then I found compelling things about it that led to me staying with it. Right. Because before I started, I, the year before maybe the same year that I published my first paper about axions, I also wrote a paper about quantum fields and curved space-time. And I actually really liked that paper and I would be interested in doing follow-up on it, but it didn't capture my attention the way that the axion work did. Is that because like the axion work is like scientifically more important in some absolute sense? I have no idea. Like who, who did, I don't know. Adonai determines that, I, I guess, right. <laughs> to the extent that one yeah. exists, right? Um, I do think like, just to go back to your previous question and in connection with this one, I did have a sense that I had to stay on a research path that translated to me getting a postdoc. Um, right. I never felt like safe taking risks that didn't have a clear path to me having an income because I didn't feel, you know, as much as I say my mom was taken care of, I couldn't go home and um, be dependent on, on my family. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that I was making certain choices that like, for example, I, am, I, I wouldn't have chosen quantum foundations because we have traditionally gotten so much messaging that quantum foundations is like a nice thing for the philosophy department to think about, but not for the physics department. And I'm actually really happy that, you know, Chapman is changing the conversation about that because I'm, that's ridiculous. And when I talk to, you know, because I do feminist philosophy of science as well, when I talk to my colleagues in the humanities, they're like, what do you mean that you guys don't teach about time in the physics department? And I'm like, there's no class in the physics department where students are really asked to think about what time is. That's not something that we teach. Um, and at the same time, it's the thing that attracts people to the physics department is that they think they're gonna learn how to talk about and think about time, right? Uh, so I do think that I was, I, I was kind of hearing very much to what is the pathway where I see a way forward for me to be successful and successful in part meant I need to have an income because I don't have anyone to depend on. Um, I also need to prove to the people who told me that I couldn't make it, that I can do this. And that increasingly as I got more senior, there were students who were like, it's so great to see a successful black woman that I couldn't fail because I knew that seeing people before me not get jobs had had such a psychological impact on me. And so that is something that, that I carry, I carry with me through the whole thing. I'm as far as like, you know, backing away from controversies in the book, I think part of it was, and I might do this differently now, I definitely want to do like another popular science book. So we'll see what happens. I wasn't sure what the, you know, when I started writing the book, I actually didn't think that there would be this much science in it. And then as I started to write it, it was like, oh, actually the science really needs to be foregrounded. The entire first section of the book needs to be science. And I think my publisher was a little taken aback by that initially. And there were some discussions <laughs> about like how, how that manifested in the title. Um, but I, I also think that because I was Lee Smolin's PhD student and he had written The Trouble with Physics and everybody saw it as this big attack on string theory that I always have to be a little bit careful about how I talk about string theory because people think I'm, I'm coming in guns blazing and I'm like, I'm not Lee. Yes. Like, <laughs> so that was part of it is that I feel, I'm not mad at Lee about it, but certainly people assume that I'm, I'm just, you know, whatever Lee says about string theory is also what I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, having been at Perimeter Institute myself, I, I noticed that there are some people who think that um, everybody who's at Perimeter Institute is basically 
agreeing with Lee Smolin, <laughs> but uh, it's definitely not, very much not like not like that. Um, anyway, um, let's let's move on to something else. I want to uh, th there, there's a lot about ethics, ethics and science in the book to, to some degree. So you talk about um, the controversy over the, the TMT uh, telescope, which you, which you got involved in. Um, you also talk about um, how, you know, funding for physics has become, you know, is, well, has been closely tied to, to the military, um, you know, at least since uh, the Second World War, at least since the, develop the Manhattan Project and the development of the atomic bomb. And this is something that, uh, you know, we need to reckon with as physicists. And, um, you know, I've always thought that everybody who has a physics degree should have a, a, a sound understanding of the history of nuclear weapons, because um, if anything makes you realize that, you know, you can't, you can't divorce the science from, from the ethics of, of the way things are used in society, you know, how it interrelates to society, where the funding comes from. It's that episode. It's a very powerful um, episode. Um, on the related topic, uh, another thing that you uh, allude to. See, I, I'm picking up on things here that you only sort of allude to, but don't go into in great, in great detail. A um, couple of times you mentioned quantum information science and how uh, lots of funding is going there and less, uh, less to uh, high energy particle physics. Uh, you know, I have to say on that, that I don't think that the funding that is being given to quantum computers right now would go to particle physics if, if that project didn't exist, it would just not be spent on science. Um, but, you know, there are very real um, ethical issues here that I have, you know, it's, it's a field that's very close to what I do. And uh, I have a very hard time persuading my colleagues that we need to look at the ethics of, you know, quantum computing, who's funding it, um, what's it going to be used for. You know, I, I often get, you know, the joke, uh, I think we need to talk about ethics in quantum computing and, and come back with you, what you mean, don't, not, don't hack your neighbor's mainframe. You know, it's like that, that, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, I, I wonder if we, could, if we could sort of talk about it because it's clear that a lot of the funding has come, you know, indirectly from uh, people. Well, there, there are people within the NSA, for instance, Although they do not fund academic research directly, indirectly through other agencies, they've they've had an influence on on the development of this field. And um, also, it's pretty one of the very very few um, one of the very very few areas of science at which in the U.S. there is bipartisan agreement that we should give loads and loads of money to. This is kind of like unprecedented when we, you know. We we think of one of the one of the two parties as being very anti-science and and you know anti you know don't want to think about climate change and things like that. When it comes to quantum computing, everybody's like, let's give them loads of money. Um, so I don't know how you know how should we start a you know how should we really start a conversation about this and and what can we do about um, you know, the, the way the way work is being used or the way it's the direction it's going in. Yeah, and I think the, the, the first place to go really is back to the Manhattan Project. And I'm, I honestly think that physics students would really benefit from a course that's really just a deconstruction of how it came to be and the aftermath. And the aftermath from, from a few different perspectives um, I remember talking to Rose Fresh, who um, was the, the spouse of one of the Manhattan Project physicists and who was a, a, a public health um, barrier breaker in woman in science in her own right. And she told me, you know, we just hoped, they hoped it wouldn't work. And so I think like one thing for students to really understand is that scientists were telling themselves these stories about the work that they were doing as it was happening. And those stories play a kind of role in shaping 
our willingness to ignore our own moral impulses, which the reason they were telling themselves these stories is because they felt unsettled about the implications of, of the work that they were doing. And, um, you know, there's this like probably going to be forever endless debate about what happened with Germany's bomb. Um, whether like Heisenberg, you know, like whether it was messed up on purpose or whether they really just didn't figure it out because they had run off all of their Jewish physicists, which was like a significant portion of, of the, the physics population in Germany. Um, I think the, you know, there's the obvious stuff, which is that the bombs themselves were devastating not just in Japan. So we talk a lot about what happened in Japan and that's not, I don't wanna minimize what happened there, but then the continued nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific has yep. left an incredibly terrible legacy for Pacific Islanders. It has damaged the relationship between Pacific Islanders and the nations that did the, the, the nuclear weapons testing. It's damaged the ecosystems. There's these long-term physical and social consequences and political consequences. There's the impact that the uranium mining had in um, African indigenous communities and also in Native American indigenous communities. So um, there are all of these different ways uh, that these different communities are linked through experiences of abuse that are tied in to these nuclear weapons. Then there is also actually the impact that it had on the scientists once they saw what they had what their work had done. And I think a lot of people, I mean, that's just like a heavy thing to live with. And I think that we should be protecting our students from finding themselves in situations where they are on the other end having to live with that. And that's not to say that's the most significant or even important consequence, but it actually does matter whether we are setting, setting our students up to live a, a good life um, and to live a life where they feel like they can go out and, and, and feel good about themselves and feel good about the contributions that they've made to the world. And if we are not giving them the tools to think through what is the ethical impact of my research, then I actually think we're cheating them and we're setting them up for a worse outcome in addition to potentially positioning themselves to set off chain reactions, like literal chain reactions, right? In the case of, of the bomb, um, that changed the world in ways that they are not happy with. And I've always been like, I actually think that I would love to teach a course on Oppenheimer because I think that he's just such an interesting figure in, in, in being the person who led the Manhattan Project and then the ways that he tried to deal with that afterwards. Um, and so I think the warning that I would give to the quantum information community is that it's not going to look the same, but certainly at some point, your students are going to find themselves having to make difficult decisions. And you've either given them the tools to think through those decisions, or you've chosen not to educate them. And, and I think that falls on all of us. It's not just for the quantum information community, although I do think it's a more pressing point for the, the quantum community than maybe for any other right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, being involved in it, you know, when I, when I started, it was kind of like, a bit like uh, what you what you described, or what you know, you, you go you look back to 1992 or so, and uh, you look at the first workshops that were ever on this subject. It was a bunch of extremely impractical people who had no interest in building computers, uh, but just thought that they'd found something interesting about you know the fundamental theory of how computation works, and that's what they were interested in. And it's exploded, you know, under under the weight of lots of funding, under the weight of lots of interest, under the weight of the possible nat national security implications into this now massive, massive thing. And it's happened extremely quickly. And I don't think uh, people have had time to, you know, time to think about that change. You know, I, I got interested in it primarily because I, I'm interested in, you know, quantum mechanics. What does quantum mechanics tell us? What's, what does quantum mechanics mean? And it seemed like a way of studying it, which had sort of some sort of tenuous relation with uh, practical consequences, which was new at the time. And that's, I think a lot of people were interested in it just uh, because of that. But now it's turned into, into something uh, completely different. And I'm not sure whether we're in uh, something equivalent to a Manhattan project or whether we're in something more like a space race 
or something completely different. Um, it's, it's its own thing. It's taken on its own life. And um, it's clear that these, you know, these technologies can be used in, in, in good ways and in bad ways. And also that uh, the, the huge focus on this right now does take uh, the focus off of other areas, other areas of physics and other areas of science. And I don't know whether that's a good thing. So you know, these, these are other things that keep me up at night at, at the moment. But uh, Yeah, I, I guess the, the one thing that I, I would add about this, you know, just going back to the funding, I think you might be right that they would just be taking the money away from particle physics anyway. But I think the point that I wanted to make in thinking about like the, the movement of the budget is that the one way of reading how the budget has shifted is where does the establishment see value for the establishment? And right. I actually think my message to my fellow particle physicists is that we are not the, the, the top dog anymore. And I'm not sure people fully understand what that means, that um, we're going to be in there just like the humanists have been for decades fighting to say, like, we should be allowed to do this thing. And in some sense, you know, I see the book as like tough love that I'm saying, you guys, there are all these things that are messed up, but I also still think there's something really beautiful about what we do. And I was trying to feed people. I hope I successfully have. Here is the case for what we do outside of these narratives of being in service to an establishment that's looking for a product that they can use. Like here is a humanist vision of why particle physics and, and cosmology are necessary. And I think that, you know, when you say, I don't know if it's gonna be like a Manhattan project or a space race, we're definitely seeing space race, right? For sure, with Mars and the moon. And yeah. I just wanna, you know, because it's, it's, we've been having the couple of weeks that we've been having and because I'm married to a Taiwanese American, I have to draw the connection between that and the violence against Asians and Asian Americans in the United States, that we're constantly banging, if you don't want to call it a war drum, like some kind of cold war type thing of we have to compete with China. When I went to a meeting with the National Science Board a, a couple of years ago, they were literally just giving us, here's how your state's spending on science and research in science compares with China's spending. And, right. and research like they're feeding even to us junior faculty china is the person you're fighting with and yeah. i just need to ask people to really think carefully about what that does to us um, as a species that needs to work together to work out global warming <laughs> among other, and also be able to walk down the street without people getting shot right yes yeah i mean i mean i <laughs> china is definitely one of the factors, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, Congress has, you know, funneled a lot of money towards quantum stuff recently, just because of the spending that's going on in China and the, 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 this perceived need to compete. Um, it, but uh, the other thing, wait, I had something else that I wanted to say, which I've now forgotten. But uh, uh, yes, so even the NSF, right, which is this is something that's quite odd to me. So, so we know that a lot of funding from for science, those fields that get really large amounts of funding, you know, we know that there's military funding, there's Department of Energy, which like vastly outweighs any other source of funding in, in this country. But even the NSF, which you might think of as the the, the sort of you know the, the civilian, most i i the call most, them the civilian funders the big civilian yeah, so funders in some yeah. sense you might call, think of them as the most benign, uh, benign funders but in their mission statement it says um that the research they fund has to be in the national interest right yeah. that's one of the things and that that's always struck me as you know as, as a non-american that struck me as bizarre because i don't think we have anything like that in the mission of say the research councils in the uk um but, not yet. Uh, not yet. Brexit. I don't but, know. But yeah, sure. But so, and the fact that that language is there has been, you know, how seriously that language is taken has depended on the administration. Like the, the you know, the Trump administration, for instance, um, were very, very serious about that, and they they were like, don't fund anything that's not in the direct, you know, national economic military interest. So it seems like. To my mind, you know, 
as far as seeking funding goes, you know, I've always, well, it's never really come up because I'm quite a pure scientist, but I've always been opposed to taking money from, from uh, military agencies. And, uh, but, you know, if you're doing quantum information, you've taken money from them because they were a sponsor of some conference that you went to, and there's nothing you can do to avoid that. Um, it, you know, where, how should things be funded? If we want, you know, what I want to do is to do science in the, in, in the global interest or in, and in the sort of just for the pursuit of truth. So how do we reconcile like the desire to do that, the desire to do just, you know, the best that we can with the fact that there really isn't a way of funding it that has, you know, that, that isn't sort of tainted in some way or another. Yeah, so a, a, a couple of a couple of thoughts. So I think when we talk about, for example, the mission of the National Science Foundation, the NSF, and the mission that they are given by the National Science Board, which which governs everything that happens at the like they set the standards by which the grants are evaluated and what the agenda will be and and all of that. Um so the for grant proposals, every grant proposal at the NSF is evaluated against two sets of criteria, the intellectual merits and the broader impacts. And the broader impacts are your research has to, something you're doing during the funding period or something you're doing with your research has to have a broader impact on society, which sounds really nice actually. And is not a particularly like, it's not a bad idea. And it can be interpreted broadly. So maybe you're writing a code that you're going to make publicly available and other people can use it in the community. And that's a broader impact because it impacts the larger scientific community in some way. Um, one of the focuses of the broader impacts is potentially you can argue that you're bringing underrepresented minorities and um, traditionally marginalized people into science in some way. And the articulation of why we should uh, increase the number of people of color from traditionally minoritized groups in science is not like, hey, you know, we should treat humans equally. Like people from East LA and West LA are both sets of humans and I'm, one's not better than the other. I'm just picking that example because like, um, when I went to college, people were like, oh, you're from the bad part of Los Angeles, right? There's, there's a, a traditional hierarchy there, although now that East LA is gentrifying, maybe not so much. Um, the argument is a national security argument, which is that in the future, if we want to have enough homegrown American-born scientists to fill our ranks of um, STEM positions that we need, because demographics in the United States are changing, that we need more people of color in science. Mm -hmm. And so the argument has nothing to do with human rights. It has nothing to do with treating black people or indigenous people equally. It's simply recognizing people of color as a resource that need to be tapped for the sake of national security. And that's an argument people have been perfectly comfortable making. Like I would say shockingly comfortable making without really thinking through the ways in which that that's actually kind of dehumanizing and consistent across administrations, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. People use the same language. So I think that that's one thing to kind of highlight of how those defense interests get embedded even in the things that people think are somehow tied to critical race theory or something like that. But nobody's talking about diversity in science because of critical race theory at the NSF. They're doing it because it's a national security consideration. That's, I, I think it's really important to be clear that like, that's what's happening. And when it comes to you know, our current funding environment, I'm thinking about Alexis Shotwell's book, Against Purity where she argues against the American tendency to be puritanical. Like the idea that like, I can be the scientist who only takes the good money, who never benefits. Um, I can somehow magically exist outside of white supremacist racialized capitalism. Um, we can't do that. And so I think that at every point, um, you know, we have to try and do the best that we can given the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And um, we also have to figure out what our lines are that we just won't cross. And sure. again, like going back to teaching our students about ethics, we're not equipping people with the tools to have that conversation with themselves, right? 
I, I was in a position to have it because like my family, I come from a family of political organizers and I was literally like basically forced to because people actually didn't approve of my interest in physics. Um, but I think a lot of people just don't have that, those tools. And so again, I think I'm, you know, we have to, we have to provide them so that people can, can make those choices. And, and there are certain choices that I have made. I don't apply for DOD money. It would make my career go a lot more smoothly if I did, but I don't do it. Yeah. I mean, I have to say this was uh, something you mentioned was one of the realizations, you know, that there's often like sort of simple things that when once they're pointed out to you are obvious, but uh, you don't, you know, I don't necessarily uh, think about them from a day to day, and that was one of these th- things. Uh, this argument that you know, liberal democracy is supposed to be about um, you know the flowering of individual talents. We're supposed to you know care about individuals, and then when it comes to the arguments uh, for diversity, um, the argument that's often made, you know, even in you know, not just at the NSF, is that. It's good for the community. You know, we're going to get uh, better ideas if we have a more diverse, you know, or, or, you know, having a more diverse workforce actually improves the bottom line of a company. And these kind of, th- kind of arguments are, are made often where it's, uh, it's really a community that's benefiting rather than the individual, whereas those kind of, you know, arguments <laughs> are never made when it comes to, to other, you know, when it comes to like, a white man getting a job, for instance. So this this was a realization for me that actually, no, you know, it is about, you know, it, it is it, it's both, right? I mean, I think the community argument often gets made uh, to convince people who otherwise wouldn't naturally do anything about it, right? So I'm sure there are people, you know, making that argument who don't necessarily believe that that's the main argument genuinely, but it's like this sort of hypocritical argument where we, we treat one group of people one way as individuals and another group as just resources for the community is, is you, know, you know, I notice it. I probably made that argument myself on, on discussions of these issues. So, you know, that, that was one of the things, one of the small things that I got out of reading the book that's sort of very clear that, uh, that this is a very hypocritical uh, position to take. Um, so anyway, thanks for the discussion on that. We, since we, you know, we have a fair bit of time left, but, you know, our audience, you know, there, there are many quantum physicists in our audience. I, you know, I want to do these talks for a popular science audience, but I know in practice that it's all like my physics professor <laughs> colleagues from, uh, from across the, the country who are watching this. Um, uh, I, want, I do want to talk about quantum mechanics a little bit. So maybe this is, this is probably going to be one of the last things that we talk about. Um, I'm going to jump in for a moment since there was a, a question from the audience quite a while ago when we were okay. talking more about science. Um, Let's do some science. Yeah, the, the question was, uh, what is Chanda, what is your perspective on the problems of time or if there are problems of time? You were talking about it uh, not being discussed in physics way back when and someone asked this question. That's true, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I feel like I this is really a question for Matt. That's kind of my question, my answer to that. Um, I will say the thing that I've been reading recently that I've been really enjoying about it is Julian Barber's new book. Um, and actually, Matt, maybe you can help me with the pronunciation. Is it the Janus point or is it the Janus point? Do you know? Um, it may depend on what side of the Atlantic you come okay, from. Let's go, <laughs> let's go British. I would say Janus, but uh, okay, it's yeah. I I would also say Janus, but also I, I grew up in a Commonwealth family, right? So my husband's always yeah. making fun of how I pronounce words like process. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess I will. I can share like what my interest in time is, which is one in my cosmology seminar for graduate students last semester. My graduate students spent quite a bit of time arguing with me about the Big Bang and where it happened. And I kept saying it happened everywhere. It is, if, if the Big Bang is even a thing, which we're not sure about in cosmology, it was a point in time rather than a point in space, which feels like a funky thing to say as someone who's trained in general relativity. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I'm doing some kind of weird three plus one s- splitting. And also then, you know, by week three, I was like, please stop asking me about this. I've already told you what my answer to this question is. 
Um, what I find interesting about Julian's argument in the Janus point is that he's thinking through um, the laws of thermodynamics. And, you know, this idea is that I'll just summarize for a general audience that um, entropy always increases and that this in some way, and there's lots of subtlety to this, defines an arrow of time for us that because time goes forward and we can't go backwards in it because entropy grows and entropy goes forward through its growth. And Julian makes the argument that this is a this is perfectly well thought through in a universe where space time is not expanding. So if you're just thinking about a box that's not in expanding space time, this is an okay conclusion to come to. But you need a new way of thinking about things in an expanding universe. So this is one of the premises of the point that he's making. And then the the conclusion that he comes to, which was on the list of, oh, this is really obvious when somebody says it out loud, is that the universe doesn't tend toward disorder, but rather toward complexity. And he actually uses the formation of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and the formation of structures in general as his argument for, um, as his empirical evidence for this. I find this to be a really compelling point, and I don't know if that's because I work on structure formation, like that's, that's one of the hats that I wear, but I found that really compelling. Galaxies are highly organized. They're not disordered. Um, and, and I also, you know, the funny thing about the title of the book is that like, I've been waiting for someone to ask me what it has to do with the second law of thermodynamics, and the answer is nothing. <laughs> the answer is completely nothing. It has, it has to do with quantum gravity, but not the second law of thermodynamics. But I found that really, so I think my current thinking on time is that I'm very interested in, in Julian's ideas, but I will also say I actually haven't completely finished the book. So it might be that by the end of the book, I'm like, this is crap, but Julian's a very smart man. So I'm interested in his ideas. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I haven't read that particular book myself. I mean, I know that there are there's various uh, studies in uh, foundations of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics that uh, talk about notions of complexity as well as, uh, so there are various notions of complexity that people um, talk about as well as entropy, which is disorder. So there's sort of this, uh, actually, you know, th this is like one of Sean Carroll's slides uh, that he always shows is, you know, you show like uh, you have the coffee and the milk separate and then you stir it and it goes through a phase of extreme complexity where you have filaments and strands of milk going through, and then at the end it's uniform again. So, so the uniform state at the end has the higher entropy, but the one in the middle has the higher complexity. So mm -hmm. complexity is something that sort of seems to, at least on a conventional account, it um, happens, you know, actually happens in highly non-equilibrium uh, systems when you're sort of transitioning from a, a more ordered state to a less ordered state, you often go through uh, transitions which have high degrees of complexity. Now, because we have an expanding universe and, uh, and, and gravity, so, you know, because we have an interplay of the gravi gravitational entropy and, and matter entropy, and, and you can think, you know, you can have, uh, there's the interaction between the two. This, I think, um, is, you know, I, I'm not an expert on cosmology or anything, but I think um, we may be able to understand the complexity of the structures of matter that we see in terms of this, you know, process of when you're going from um, an ordered state to a less ordered state, you transition through these uh, states of high complexity. People propose specific measures of complexity as well, although, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly a world expert on these things. Yeah. I, I guess, so this, this was going to be kind of the, the question that I raised is if you think about, for example, the scenarios that Katie Mack talks about in, in, in her recent book, um, where she's thinking about, the book is called The End of Everything, right? And she's thinking about different scenarios where the universe dies or something like that. And currently in cosmology, the, the mainstream story is that because space-time is not only expanding, but the expansion is accelerating, that basically everything is going to be stretched out. And at some point, the sky is going to be really boring to look at because everything's going to be so far away that light will never be able to reach us because it will be on the other side of what we call 
um, you know, a cosmological horizon um, or the, the Hubble horizon. Um, so I guess then the question that you could ask yourself is, is space time at that point so diluted that it becomes like a homogenous, like can you articulate that as like a homogenous state that went through a phase of complexity that is now, um, but you would still have galaxies on the other end and um, you still have star production, although I guess the star production becomes increasingly less frequent. So maybe that that's an argument for for exactly that that Sean Carroll scenario. Yeah, I mean, yes, it, it's not it's not a, a a problem that I've had you know a great deal of thoughts about, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you know when it comes to when you start adding gravity into thermodynamics, uh, things quickly become very interesting, but <laughs> also quite complicated. Um, yeah, I do want to talk to you about quantum mechanics, though, um, partly because, um, you know, in your book, you do mention that, um, and you mentioned it already, that it's not encouraged to study the foundations of quantum mechanics in in, uh, in sort of mainstream physics circles, and uh, also, you know, that you, ha you haven't pursued it yourself. I mean, sometimes, I can't remember if you said this in the book, but you've said it to me anyway, that you that you don't see how to make progress there. You've certainly said that to me in, in the past. Oh, well, um, I was being a jerk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I uh, so so um, one source that you uh, have quoted from quite a lot in the book that comes up quite a lot is um, this book by uh, Karen Barad, um, mm -hmm. Meeting the Universe Halfway. Um, and so given that it was a recommendation as when I finished reading your book, I've, I started reading it. I have to say I'm only on like the second chapter. So it's more, I'm not just more going through what she's, you know, what she says things aren't like, <laughs> you know, the, the, at the beginning of the book, there's a lot of, okay, this person had this theory and it's not that. And it's, but, uh, but, so, so we're not re yet on the part where I'm uh, really learning exactly how uh, her theories are, uh, are constructed um, but you know I thought it was interesting uh, you know I didn't want to skip to just the bits on quantum mechanics because I feel like I would lose context if I if I did that so I'm making a I'm making a good faith attempt to uh, to read that book and uh, you know I have to say you know my experience so far it oscillates between things that I Think I think I follow very well and think I understand very well, and then things which I understand less well because I'm less familiar with the um, areas of of uh, philosophy and, and science studies that she's drawing on. So you know there, there are bits that are a bit jargony, and I'm not sure if I'm following. Um, but so but it does seem like uh, you know you have an interest in her work and her perspective on things, and uh, at the same time. You've said uh, that you don't, ha <laughs> you haven't got any thoughts on quantum mechanics, but she has quite a lot to say about quantum mechanics. So, so I, I wonder if uh, if you if you do have anything to say about quantum mechanics that's sort of inf influenced by that perspective. Yeah. So I should say, by the way, that I am Karen uses they them pronouns uh, now. Uh, so and, yes. Yeah, and um, you know. That's a hard book. I'm actually like, you know, as a friend of yours, I'm like, yes, now I finally have someone else to another physicist to talk with about the book. Because usually I'm trying to talk with the with with feminist theorists about the book. And they're all like, so yeah. I don't understand physics necessarily, but here's what I got from it. And um, it's hard to find people to have conversations uh, with about about that book. I'm I will say yes you know, the book is sort of a gateway in some sense, because, you know, there, there are these claims about Bohr's interpretation of quantum mechanics that I don't think I had ever in my entire life looked up any of the original papers on quantum mechanics. But that book made me go searching for Bohr's writing so that I could read it for myself, because I wanted to see, do I agree with how Karen is framing things. And so I have, I'm, I'm still kind of in, in the, the process of, of trying to kind of disentangle that. 
But one of the things that I think is really beautiful about that book is that it encourages us to actually go back to the original literature and think with it and read it. And I think that that's another thing that doesn't happen very often in physics education, particularly in quantum mechanics, is that the race is always on to find like the perfect quantum mechanics textbook that teaches us how to calculate. Like you want to make sure that people know the WKB approximation. You want people to, you know, a, a TD like square well. Like there are like very specific things that, that people have to like know how to calculate in. You do it once at the undergraduate level, then you do it again at the graduate level. Um, and I should say, by the way, that the second semester of undergraduate quantum mechanics is the first time I got an A in, um, <laughs> in physics. <laughs> wow. So um, maybe I have some kind of affinity. I think I was particularly interested in lasers and Bose-Einstein condensates, which coincidentally yeah. is now I work on Bose-Einstein condensate dark matter, right? So it all comes together. But I, I think what's interesting about that book is that it actually suggests that I am you know, these conversations that we're having about the social location of the newer are not actually necessarily separate from some of the conversations about um, interpretations of quantum mechanics. And I think that Karen makes a compelling case that even if we don't agree with them about it, that we should be able to articulate for ourselves why we think Karen is wrong. Yes. <laughs> and that's, I think that's the beauty and the challenge of the book is like, you could be sitting there and being like, there's no way Karen's right about any of this, but I haven't been able to convince myself that I have an argument for, for, for why, for why Karen's wrong. And I think that I'm a beautiful thing that Karen does is that they make you think. And I'm, you know, just, you know, going back to these questions about time, et cetera, that sometimes we're encouraged to think in a calculational way, but we're not encouraged to really think in a conceptual way. And um, Karen makes you think in a conceptual way and makes you go back to the original source and say, not what, do, what did my physics textbook say to me about this, but what do I think about what Bohr said? And so kind of giving us that entitlement to develop our own opinion about it. And I think that that is a really powerful thing. I should also say that, um, you know, Karen, their PhD is in particle physics. They were um, a QCD expert who became really concerned about the entangle entanglement with the military and saw quantum foundations as kind of a refuge from, mm -hmm. from that and moved into quantum foundations for that reason. And has also been like a great support and champion of my work. And so, um, I still feel like I'm working through understanding their theory of agential realism, but I, I think that we should talk about it. Yes, I mean, I, I certainly want to talk to you about it more once I'm a bit further through. I mean, I have to say that um, in, in the Quantum Foundations community, going back and reading Neil Spohr is like, so there, there's practically a cottage industry of papers where uh, historians and philosophers of science write papers saying, well, this is what Niels Bohr really meant to say. And uh, another community who say, well, let's just ignore what he said because it's so convoluted and impossible to understand, but it's unclear whether he had a sort of clear idea. I mean, if, you, if you've ever read his response to the einstein podolsky rosen paper, it's full of such turns of phrase that, you know, it's very easy to... to uh, put more into it than, than is there. I mean, I've, I've tended to think that, you know, although, although the foundations of quantum mechanics, you know, challenges us, challenges the, the picture of, it challenges the picture of reality that we have in, in science. Um, there are, you know, I, I'm, I'm more open to probably some of the stuff that uh, people talk about in, in science studies than many physicists would be. You know, to some, to some degree, I am a child of the science wars because when I was going through university, there were these great debates between sociologists and physicists about the nature of reality going on. And I took a, a sociology course about the nature of uh, scientific inquiry when I was an undergraduate. My, my uh, physics advisor at the time says, wouldn't you rather take a course on fluid mechanics? And 
I said no, and he said, "Well, okay then, but don't believe anything they tell you." Right. <laughs> so, so you know, I, I've been involved in that kind of controversy um, for for a long time, and you know, although I don't totally agree with one take on it or another, I'm much more open to you know some of the stuff that came out of sociology of science around that time. So, you know, it's, it's for me, it's not like a, a great leap into into the unknown to, to to talk about this kind of stuff when it comes to the foundations of quantum mechanics you know we can we can separate sort of there, there are issues in general philosophy of science about you know realism versus anti-realism uh what's what what do our theories you know really mean about the nature of reality um are you know are things social constructions and, and issues like that that we can have but nonetheless um, you can have those issues. You can have those discussions about, say, classical electromagnetism. You know, what what is an electron in classical electromagnetism? Um, and the, there's valid arguments that you could give on, on, on various sides. To me, what's interesting though is that it's possible, even if you don't believe the story, it's possible to give a story about things that exist in reality behaving in certain ways, uh, independent of us. When you talk about classical electromagnetism, you may not believe that story because you may believe, you know, you may have um, believe in theories about um, how science progresses that are incompatible with believing in the reality of electrons, for instance. But nonetheless, that story is there, and that story is there and can be told uh, for every theory up until we get to quantum mechanics, basically. Um, so. To me, the question's always not really been about, um, you know, it's kind of, and maybe I'm, I'm looking at things too narrowly, but for me, the question has always been uh, about the internal explanatory structure of quantum mechanics itself. The fact that whether I believe in realism or not doesn't really matter, but the question is, can I, can I come up with a story that's anything like or bears any resemblance to the stories that we had before? what kind of explanatory resources do I need to understand what's going on in quantum mechanics? So I've always been kind of skeptical about drawing, you know, certainly about analogical, analogical reason. I mean, um, Karen is saying that they, uh, that they are not doing that kind of reasoning, but I haven't got to the point where I, where I've probably understood that. Um, but, and I think I'll, I'll just say that I think like one of I use as an epigraph for one of the chapters in the disordered cosmos, a section where Karen is arguing against anal to analogical yes. thinking. Um, and that was I actually think that's really refreshing because I think it's actually a challenge to feminist theory as well. It's not just to, to physicists. Yeah. Yeah. So so I, I don't know. I mean, all I'm saying is I'm going in I'm going in open minded, but I think uh There'll be lots to discuss when we get when we get further into it. Excellent! Um, I look forward to we, it. We have um, unfortunately run out of time for the main discussion, um, but I'd like to go into a Q and A period if we can. Um, so, Kai, if you would like to uh, bring in any questions that have come from the chat to to Chanda. So and, there aren't any new ones at present. There was uh, some clarification about the the name of the book and the author you were just talking about, but I think we, we got that sorted out. So the floor is open if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so please, uh, anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, um, please put it in the chat. Um, There's going to be a little bit of delay anyway, so why don't you continue with yeah. some discussion? We, we could here. continue talking about... Uh, quantum mechanics for, for, for forever. But actually, I've forgotten to do something anyway while we're waiting, which is that when we have somebody who's just written a book on this, uh, on this, on these events, uh, we normally do a book giveaway. Now, uh, apparently your book has been very successful, Chanda, because I haven't actually been able to obtain the physical paper copies of the book in time. We had some, uh, we had some issues with, with our order. Um, and I think it's back ordered now. So we will have them eventually. They're ordered. And, and when if we... you were trying to order from Bookshop, Bookshop has restocked because okay. my publisher printed more copies. So good. 
yeah we, we yeah. are going to get the, we are going to get them soon so we are going to do our usual book giveaway and i will give you the url this is this is very low tech you know when once i get a much more high tech studio i'm going to learn how to do like lower thirds and stuff but for now this is the url i hope people can see that i don't know if that's clear um, rebrand.ly forward slash like give me a book <laughs> yes all one word okay so if you go there um you can you can enter to win a copy of the book it's only for people in the us and canada unfortunately we can't ship books uh, all over the world um and there is an opportunity there if you haven't done so already to uh, sign up to get notifications about uh, our future events you don't have to um, if you just want to enter to grab the book but there's an option to um put in your email address if you want to get emails about the future institute for quantum studies events so i hope people will do that um and then when the books arrive we will send them out <laughs> um during that time did we get any questions kai not yet Okay, well, we can keep talking about what we keep talking about. But I do want to ask you, Chanda, is, is now that we've been talking for almost an hour, uh, we certainly haven't touched on, you know, there's many, many things in the book that we haven't touched on. But uh, are there things that you really want to talk about in this conversation that we haven't, we haven't got to yet? Yeah, I mean, I have questions for you, which I, I think, you know, so we've we've touched a lot on this kind of question of like ethics and the ethics that we should be teaching our students or at least giving our students tools to think about what their own ethics is going to be. Yes. Um, but you know, coming back to these questions about the fact that there isn't really room to think about time or to think about, you know, what do we mean when we talk about these laws of thermodynamics besides like air conditioners and refrigerators and car no cycles. And I don't know, I said something controversial, like um, thermodynamics is magic and statistical mechanics is real physics recently on Twitter, which, which got a series of like very strong reactions from people. But I guess, you know, if we were reconfiguring the physics curriculum, to make it expansive in, in ways that would maybe make you happier with, with what students are, are learning and hearing about, you know, what kinds of changes would we be making to our, our physics curriculum? Well, I mean, I've thought about this a bit recently, specifically, you know, after reading your book. And, you know, it occurs to me that it's not just a physics curriculum problem. It's really a general education curriculum problem. So, you know, I'm here at a university that, you know, is some t in the distance past was more of a liberal artsy type of place. I mean, we still have that kind of mission as well, although obviously the university is expanding um, to become more of a research oriented university right now. So that tradition is still strong here. And uh, it's, you know, it's quite strong in a lot of places all over the US. Um, undergraduates have general education requirements and then what happens it's like okay you have to take a history class oh but I'm a physics student I want to learn physics so what class do you take you know you get a lot of these people taking like um, the history of surfing now I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with learning the history of surfing it's probably a very very interesting course but I think the point of these requirements was to try and make people into more well-rounded um more well-rounded individuals and to to be able to think about their subject from a variety of points of view so you know if you're going to if you're going to give a science student a, a history requirement or a humanities requirement why not part of that should be a requirement to do something that's relevant to your fit in the context of your field Right. So I'm not necessarily saying, you know, it would probably not be practical to require every physics student take a course on the history of the atomic bomb, although, you know, that would be uh, that would be nice to see. But, um, you know, maybe in these general education requirements, if they have you know, coursework, project work, uh, students should be required to do something that is relevant to their field. So if you're taking a history course, then 
uh, you should be required to uh, produce your project on something to do with the history of physics. If you're taking an ethics course, then, and you're a science major, your project should be something on the ethics of science. Like to bring, because otherwise, what happens with general education right now is it seems very, you know, people think, oh, this is just something I've got to do. And it's very disconnected from the core subject that they're doing. So I'd like to see uh, those kind of requirements more sort of circle around uh, the major that you're doing in some way or another. I'm not exactly sure how to do it. I yeah. think that would, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is kind of an interesting idea because I was, a, I was as you were talking initially, I was kind of like, well, I'm not sure I agree because, you know, the one thing you don't want to happen is to have a whole population of like physics, uh, physicists and chemists and et cetera, who, you know, don't know anything about the history of race in the United States, right? Sure. And we're actually kind of seeing like the consequences of that. But then I kind of came around to the idea that, um, you know, maybe that's the history of physics class that they take, which is learning about like, you know, for example, the, the history of how nuclear weapons development and deployment was a racialized process from, you know, uh, poisoning land and water supplies, for example, um, on Navajo land to who in St. Louis lives near a um, nuclear waste site. And uh, the, the colonialism in Africa points being driven by who has access to uranium mines there and all of these things. So there actually are these ways that we can do these history of science classes that also tell these stories of colonialism and, and racism in, in a global sense. And, you know, we've been having a discussion about this at the, at the University of New Hampshire. And I, I certainly think as a public university, we have failed our students if they're not walking away from the university with a basic understanding of several hundred years of American history and racial dynamics. And mm -hmm. the last like few years have really shown us what happens when people don't understand history, right? I would say like my one objection to this is that um, I, the, the classes that I didn't think would be impactful for me as an intellectual ended up being ones that I drew from in like unexpected ways. And so, you know, when I think about like, I, like just as a good example, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on the history of surfing <laughs> since, since okay. you brought it up as an example, <laughs> that like if taught properly, right, then it becomes yeah. a, an indigenous studies course, right, because, um, because of the, the role that surfing plays in, in Native Hawaiian culture. The problem is, is that it's often not taught like that, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, part of it is figuring out there's the content of the course, and then there's actually what your goal is for what the students are able to do on the other end of the course. And so I think about like the, the cosmology seminar that I taught last semester. So like ostensibly they were supposed to understand the Friedman Robertson Walker universe on the other end and be able to, you know, basically say these are, this is the cosmic timeline. These are the different points on the timeline, that kind of thing. But really my goal for the course was that the students would be good at picking up stuff that they didn't understand and getting stuff out of it. Mm -hmm. So there was lots of um, like reading archive papers and reading, um, yeah, reading recent papers like the, the Planck 2018 results from the Planck um, Cosmic Microwave Background Telescope. The other thing that I had them do is that they had to read classic papers from cosmological history. And I didn't have anyone make me do that, but they will say, I didn't just learn about how the Hubble constant. I read the original Hubble constant paper. And that also meant that sometimes they were reading classic papers in the field that had wrong things in them. And they had to learn to say, oh, Chandra Shekhar wrote something down that was wrong. Yeah. And that was more important to me than whether they knew anything about FRW on the other end, which was that they knew how to ask questions and do it better and get comfortable with as a physicist. Um, most of the time you're confused about something. If you're not confused, you're probably not doing science anymore. Oh, well, that means I'm doing science all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, look, we're having these kinds of conversations in, in, in Chapman right now. I mean, uh, you know, I 
I think it's fair to say that, you know, Chapman University doesn't have necessarily the best historical record on uh, diversity and inclusion and things like that. It's something that's become a big, um, a big thing now, and we're sort of a bit behind the curve. Uh, curve. Um, we are only now beginning to discuss having a, a general education requirement about, uh, you know, about the, about these kind of issues, which you know most of the UC system has uh, had in place for years. So these discussions are becoming sort of very relevant. How to integrate this into the curriculum? That's a discussion that's going on here right now. So you know, I can't say that I have the solutions to it, but it's you know, it's something that uh, that you know is very much at the center of of you know the discuss, discussion of the curriculum that we're that we're doing right now. So, so uh, we have a relevant question from the audience. Uh, sure. Um, so, Chanda, can you talk about your joint appointment in women and gender studies in physics slash astronomy? Did you seek out that joint work or did it come unexpectedly out of your interests? Yeah, so one thing that I think can be really hard to grasp from the, from the title is that it's actually not a joint appointment. Um, and I find myself explaining this to fellow academics all of the time. So um, whoever asked that question, you shouldn't feel like you've, you've uniquely confused things. Um, I have a 100% tenure appointment in the physics department and my core faculty appointment in women's and gender studies means that I can attend faculty meetings and I have some rights within the department, but they don't actually um, get to vote on whether I get tenure or promotion and my service responsibilities are to the physics department and that's where my teaching responsibilities are too. Um, it is something that in the case, by the time I got to being a faculty member, or you know, getting offers for faculty positions, and I was lucky to have multiple offers. I knew that I wanted to continue some of the research that I was doing in Black feminist science, technology, and society studies. And I wanted to have an a, appointment that facilitated that by providing me interactions with colleagues who could support me in doing that work and access to a different community. And I've been incredibly lucky that at the University of New Hampshire, I would say that our Department of Physics, no shade on Chapman, you all are lovely as well, um, but our Department of Physics is like a unicorn department. Um, people are, have been incredibly supportive of me holding expertise in, in two areas of work, and they've also tried as much as possible to give me what I like to say the space time to do both. So I'm currently on a teaching release right now so that I can focus on when having these conversations about the book, but also actually preparing my, um, pr my proposal for my second book, which will be a peer reviewed text. And that takes time. And so instead of saying, okay, Chanda, you will do less physics and in exchange, you will do more of this. They've actually really tried to work with me to give me the opportunity to have a full research group. So I have three graduate students right now. I have an undergraduate, I have a postdoc working with me. I'm also collaborating with um, people at Stanford and at the University of Amsterdam. And so I have like a really active physics research program and I've been given the fiscal resources and the time to do that. Um, and, you know, when I say like, look, here's my perspective on this like equity issue that's coming up in the department as someone who holds more expertise on this topic than even the senior faculty in the department. People in the department understand that, you know, expertise is expertise. And I feel really well supported as a junior faculty member that I'm actually safe to, to, to bring those things to the conversation in faculty meetings. And also the folks in women's and gender studies are constantly looking out for me and checking in and seeing if, if, if I'm happy with how things are going. So I really think like I kind of won the lottery with the appointment in some sense. And, and also New Hampshire is beautiful. <laughs> like I have to say, like it's a nice place to live. Yes, well, you know, I hope we'll, I hope we'll get to that level here eventually in physics. I have to say we're a very uh, white male department at the moment. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, were there any, are there any other questions in the, in the chat, Kai? Anything else that came up? Uh, not as yet. Not as yet. Okay. I'm trying to think about. Well, we got about ten minutes left. Um, we can 
What were we talking about before we were talking about um, education? Which, which of the curriculum look like? I mean, <laughs> I, I kind of thought you were going to say something about, well, we should have, um, you know, a class where students are actually encouraged to think about what all of these things mean and not just like how to calculate. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, so certainly I try to, t I actually tried to teach that class. You know, I have a, the, the you know, we have a, and, and, you know, we're not the only place that has it, but they're rare. We have a Foundations of Quantum Mechanics class for, for undergraduates. I actually started it as a class um, for mainly aimed at junior and senior physics students. But then I realized that I wasn't going to get a huge audience. So in the last iteration, I got together with um, Professor McQueen in, in the philosophy of uh, in the philosophy department here. He does philosophy of quantum mechanics, amongst other things, and he had experience teaching it to um, to undergraduates who had no experience, nothing beyond high school mathematics. So I said, okay, we're going to do some kind of hybrid. We're going to try and do the way that you introduce it, uh, but at the same time, I really want to get to some of the contemporary issues, you know, some of the sort of cutting edge research issues. So we, we've done one iteration of that. And it was more popular because we managed to draw from, um, from physics and philosophy. But, you know, something like that is an elective. You know, in the current system, something like that is an elective. I don't know that I want to, like, force um, all students to, to necessarily take a course like that. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we're in a difficult situation with a subject like physics because, you know, at the, one, at the one end, it is sort of deep you know, that involves deep reflections about the nature of reality. But on the other hand, it's a technical subject where people are supposed to come out with certain, uh, certain abilities. And, you know, I don't want to um, look at a degree as just a route to employment. But at the same time, when we're doing these things, we have to bear in mind, what do the grad schools want? What do the, what do the employers who employ physicists want people to come out of this degree with? So you know you're in a you're in a a bit of a difficult situation. I mean, I would say I would like these kinds of things to be more integrated into into just the main physics curriculum, right? You know, there there are interesting issues in the in the in the history of even classical mechanics or in the foundations of classical mechanics that you could um, talk about. You know, the whole um, you know Leibniz versus Newton. Julian Barber, you you mentioned, is you know a strong proponent of the the rel, you know the the um, relational kind of uh, Leibniz kind of view, and these debates you know happened, and we could certainly do something about it in in this in these classes. But you know, on the other hand, you know all those students in physics one hundred and one, uh, most of them aren't physics majors, and uh, you know every time. Every time you make uh, some modification to that curriculum, suddenly uh, you find there are chemistry professors and and uh, uh, saying, "Why were you teaching this and not that?" And you're like, "Oh, hang on a minute, I have to think about this. How this fits in with that curriculum?" So it's it's a sort of very complicated interlocking in, interlocking courses, and and you know, so anything something you, so you can do small things. I mean, it's very easy to like say, "Okay." I'm going to have one class. I'm going to spend an hour on it, right? But this sort of strikes me. This this is sort of very piecemeal, and it's sort of what we've done in quantum mechanics. Like I'm sure that you went through this process process when you taught your undergraduate quantum mechanics. The lecturer uh, usually saves one lecture at the end to talk about the conceptual stuff, right? And I remember. Um, I don't think you know, we got that. I don't, I don't I was, even think we got that. Okay. When I, well, when I was an undergraduate, so, so you know, normally, you know, and, and I think things are getting slightly better because, you know, quantum information has made things slightly better. There are more people with an interest in these kind of things around, but it's usually one of two things. It's, a, it's, it's like a garbled treatment of the measurement problem together with decoherence. Right. That's yeah. what I got. That's yeah. what I got when I was an undergraduate, one lecture on that. And I have to say, I had no idea what the lecturer was talking about. But like, look, like part of the problem, right, is that, and this is like, it becomes a feedback loop, which is that 
we're not competent to teach that stuff. Like I, I, I mean, so we have this, you're competent. So I shouldn't say we, you sure. are. <laughs> Most of the rest of us are not, right? So even if I wanted to offer a class like that, I mean, I think for me, my entry point would probably be teaching Karen Barad's book because like that's something that I spent time thinking about. And I might just say like, look, let's just sit and think with this book for a semester and read some of the things that Karen is citing and see if we can come to some conclusions about what we think about it. No. I can see doing that with graduate students. I think it would be much harder to do that with undergraduates. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I really think that there's a problem here, which is that physicists are actually like often the least competent people to say anything to you about like the history of physics or <laughs> the philosophy of physics. Um, unless it's something that they've personally taken an interest in, right? Sure. Or they have some, yeah. some background. And I do feel like, I, I, because I mentioned that being associated with Lee Smolin comes with some difficulties, I, I feel like I should say like one, one positive thing about that, which was that, um, you know, Lee, one of the first science conversations that he and I ever had, we were stuck in traffic between Toronto and Waterloo. And Lee asked me what I thought the solution to the measurement problem was. And, you know, just coming back to that early question you asked me about, you know, what did I feel like I had permission to think about? I literally had not thought of the measurement problem as something that I was allowed to have opinions on, right? Yeah. And so I wasn't trained for it. I'm still not really trained to talk to people about the measurement problem, like ask Matt about it, not me. But there, we really do have a problem that even if we did want to start making shifts there, is that we would have to... I um, do something about the competencies that are in physics departments that we actually don't have people who are equipped to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I back, back in the days when I used to write a blog, I think I had a draft of a blog post, which I never posted, um, which was called something like why every physics department should hire one person in quantum foundations. Now I had- That sounds you know, really self-serving. <laughs> it was very self-serving. At the time, I didn't have a job. Um, yeah, exactly. But, but just, you know, the, the, part of the argument is, you know, I know, I actually know that there are a lot of people who get put off of physics by, by quantum mechanics. Um, because, you know, I, I know people like, you know, even family relatives who were, who were physics majors, but, you know, felt that when it came to quantum mechanics, you know, they didn't understand what was going on. And so they said, well, okay, I'm just, I'm going to go into engineering or something. I, I think there are, I don't, there I don't are people who, that experience. <laughs> there are people who are put off because when they ask these questions, they don't get um, good answers. They're either told there's, you know, there's nothing wrong uh, everything that Niels Bohr sorted it all out. So if you don't understand it, it's your problem, which is a very bad thing to say because like somebody comes in questioning and you tell them, you basically tell them, oh, you're not clever enough to understand it. Then that's that that does put people off. I understand it, or they or they're told, you know, there's no problem or whatever, or a very confused uh, version of it. And it's not everybody that does that, of course, because you know there are people who understand these things around, but. Um, you know, I, I just think that um, in the physics community, there isn't, there isn't often a recognition amongst physicists that being an expert in a field that uses quantum mechanics, does not, which is virtually every field of physics these days, does not make you an expert on the foundations of quantum mechanics. I mean, like, I would say that's like a lesson that physicists need to learn in general, which is just sure. because like you're good at something relating to physics doesn't make you an expert at being good at everything else. I mean, this is like a running joke about physicists, which is that sure. physicists think that like they know everything yeah, exactly. once they've, they've learned how to solve, how to solve a problem. And so I think a little humility would go a long way, but I, I don't know. I, I guess like I feel reinvigorated by this conversation that I would like to see us intervene more so that students do have the opportunities to let their minds wander a little bit at least yeah i mean my approach to teaching quantum mechanics you know in, in chapman we're kind of lucky because we have the main quantum mechanics sequence and then we also have um quantum information elective quantum foundations elective so i don't have to try and do everything everything in 
the mainstream quantum mechanics elective. But my approach, I don't know whether it works that well, is to just in the main mainstream quantum mechanics courses, is to just try and be honest about things, mm. right? So I'm not, it's not a quantum foundations course. So I'm not going to teach you, uh, okay, there's five different interpretations. And this guy says that this is what's happening in the double slit experiment. And this guy, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to, however, say like, when we talk about the uncertainty principle, I'm not going to say things that you often hear, like, it's not just that we don't know the position of the particle. It's that the position of the particle is literally indeterminate. No, I'm going to, try and describe you know, the operational meaning of that statement in terms of like when you make a measurement, this is what happens. And I'm going to say, well, look, you know, there are various ways of thinking about this, some of which are true on different approaches to quantum mechanics. Um, all of those views on it have, have problems. And if you want to know more about it, please, <laughs> please take my class or ask me outside of class. I'm just going to try and take an honest approach, like to, you know, I, uh, one of my favorite, here's my favorite physics joke. Um, it's the, about the importance of the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle is that there's always a great deal more uncertainty about anything in the, <laughs> anything about quantum mechanics than any physicist will tell you. Like any statement a physicist makes about quantum mechanics, there's always a gr much greater deal of uncertainty about it. That's the fundamental. That's like almost a dad joke, but like yeah, well, not I quite a dad, a dad so. joke. So. Yeah, well, so I, I want to, like, I don't want to confuse my students. So I want to be sort of very clear. This is what the operational meaning of this statement is. Like, if you make this measurement, this is what you'll see, right? Mm. But that, but then I don't want to sort of, you know, I, I think like not everybody is an expert on um, what are the possible meanings of that. You know, there's sort of a standard Copenhagen line that you get fed and that standard Copenhagen line is fairly confusing to students, I think. Um, so, you know, I just, I try to take an honest approach to it. I don't teach the foundations of quantum mechanics, but I'm trying not to put people off by, um, by, by saying confusing things that is going to, are going to confuse them, right? So, so you know, I, I hope that for, that students don't come out of my class with the same kind of feelings that I'm describing of, oh, I don't understand quantum mechanics, so I must be uh, there's something wrong with me. I better leave physics. I'm trying to avoid people having that kind of experience. Anyway, um, we are we are at time now. Um, assuming that there's nothing, it doesn't look like there's anything else in the in the chat room. So are there any final things you want to say? Do you want to tell people where to find you on social media and things like that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm on Instagram, chanda.prescott.weinstein. And um, I would just tell people to Google Chanda Prescott Weinstein and my name uh, my, and, and Twitter if you want to find my Twitter handle rather than me spelling it out and people trying to remember what I said. Um, yeah. I, I, I hope people will consider picking up the book. It's meant to be broadly accessible to audiences who maybe haven't thought about feminist theory or haven't thought about cosmology or why quarks are awesome or neutrinos are awesome. And um, if you do pick it up, I hope you find the book useful. And I will second that recommendation for the book. I should all read it. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Chanda, I am going to, I, this is where I would usually announce what we're going to have uh, next month, but it's still in the process of being organized. So please uh, keep an eye on your emails for an announcement. Uh, we should hopefully have another one of these events in, in April. So thanks everyone for joining us today. And I hope we'll see you again in April. Thanks for having me. Okay, we are now.